In this video, we're going to see Jan Nepomniachtchi, a top Russian player, take on Kirill Alexenko, another top Russian player. This is the FIDE Candidates Tournament 2021. The winner of the candidate will take on Magnus Carlsen for the world title. If it is your first time here, hello, my name is William. Let's begin. E5. When I saw this move, I knew something had gone terribly wrong for black. I would never ever play this move unless I absolutely had to because it just allows white to place his knight on a brilliant square. Knight f5. And on this square, you're attacking the bishop, defended by the queen, and this capture happened in the game, but now you're just bringing white's pieces into the game. Let's consider this absolute perfect position for white. Bishops, slice the board. Rooks control the open files. Knight can hop in. Queen is well placed. Attacking e5, facing the king. This is an absolutely perfect position for white. A dream position. Here are the video sections. We have the highlights and opening and alternative setup I'm going to show you. Never play this move unless you have to. Middle game, final moments, and then to end this video, a bonus puzzle. Nepo versus Li Chao. Mates in two. Timestamps are below. Jan Nepomniak, she has white, Kirill Alexenko has black, c4, knight f6, and g3. We have the English setup. White controls the central square, black also controls it, but the point of this move, g3, is so then white can put a bishop on this diagonal, also controlling the square. g3, e6, bishop g2, d5, so black has control on d5 as well. Knight f3, black now captures the pawn. White chooses to immediately grab the pawn back with queen a4 check. After black deals with the check, white is going to pick up the pawn. Black chooses to block with the knight and queen takes e4. I just want to show you a cool way to block is c6. Because after queen takes c4, black can now play b5, attacking the queen. The queen goes back and now bishop b7. And we got a lot of options for black. This is just a totally different way to play. But I just want to point this out. Because when you watch my videos, I'm going to make suggestions so then you can apply them in your own games. Let's turn the board around. So when you get this position in your games, try these moves. Get the bishop out and then castle. The queen tends to belong on b6, along with the knight on d7. So in these kind of positions, the knights defend each other. And then black might go c5 as well, supported with a rook on c8. So let's just put these moves into action. Let's say castle. Bishop e7, d4, queen b6, knight c3, knight d7, rook d1, castle. And black might time it later. Rook on c8. And then c5, trying to break open the center. It's just a totally different way to play, but I just wanted to suggest it to you anyway. Back to the game. Queen a4 check, knight d7, queen takes c4, a6. With this move, black is planning to go b5, attack the queen. So deliberately retreating the queen back, and now c5, striking in the center. Knight c3. In this position, black can play a couple of moves with the rook. Rook b8, rook a7 are both good. The reason rook a7 is possible, I mean, it just looks so weird, right? Why on earth do you put the rook on this square? Is because later, you're going to play b5 or b6. Let's say b5. And the point of this move is so then the rook can come in the game, maybe to c7. Or the bishop can compete against white's bishop on this diagonal. Later on in the game, you're going to see this is going to be the problem piece for black. So this is one option. In the game, after knight c3, black played the normal looking move, bishop to e7, castle. Black can still play rook a7 or rook b8, castle, d4. Opening up the center, so then white's pieces start flowing in the middle of the board. After d4, black can play b6. Maybe black can even play b5. So then black will put his bishop competing against white's. b5 is possible, or b6. And if you take... Then you can take back, or you can play this really, really cool move. You don't even take for a move. You just compete against each other on the diagonal. I know I keep saying this, but later on in the game, you're going to see this is the main problem for black. And if b4, which looks like a way just to defend your pawn, you can actually just break it up with a5. You can't play a3 because take, and then the rook is pinning this pawn. So you might have to go bishop a3 and then take, take. It looks like you're going to get your pawn back. If you look at this position, it's just much better than what actually happened in the game. But black now captures towards the center. And with this capture, which looks okay, knight takes d4. I know I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. This bishop is an incredible piece exerting so much pressure on the black position. 
this bishop is just absolutely terrible, which we're going to see very soon. White has everything going for him. Queen c7, rook d1, rook d8, and bishop e3. This is a, an absolute dream position for a d4 player, a c4 player. How so? A couple of bishops are staring this side of the board. But the problem is the situation has cleared in the center. If you look at this position, there are no pawns. There are no C or D pawns. And white's pieces are just exerting so much pressure on this side. A couple of rooks near the middle. One, two. And you've got two very well-placed knights anyway, ready to hop in. Knight B6. The point is, this knight is going to hop in towards the center. Maybe it can go to D5, to C4. Rook C1. E5. When I saw this move, I knew something had gone terribly wrong for black. I would never ever play this move unless I absolutely had to because it just allows white to place his knight on a brilliant square. Knight f5. And on this square, you're attacking the bishop, defended by the queen, and this capture happened in the game, but now you're just bringing white's pieces into the game. If we look at this position, it's so difficult for black to move. You can't play bishop d7. Because I was thinking, maybe move the bishop. And if white played a normal move, maybe bishop e8. There's, there's a way to, you know, get black's rooks in the middle as well. So then you're competing against white's rooks. But the problem is, there's a cool move here, I think. After bishop d7. It's because the queen needs to defend his bishop. So pause the video now or let the timer run. Can you find a brilliant move for white? The brilliant move is knight d5. You're using the pressure on the c-file, and black is black as knight takes bishop check. So if you take, because with this capture you defend, then take, 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 and white has found a way in. Look at the pressure. That arrow, <laughs> I've just kept drawing the entire game. Now the rook is in the game, putting pressure on that pawn as well. That pawn is going to drop. So this was one way forward for white. If you take, then you can take with check, and then you can take this way. That is the vital difference. With this capture, by capturing backwards, this bishop is now attacking that knight. There's no time to take that. Take, take, you are a piece down. If you somehow move the knight, I don't know, doesn't have a good spot, then bishop c5. So maybe this is why black had to play e5 and after this move allowing a gorgeous knight on f5 this is such a difficult position to play take take and let's consider this absolute perfect position for white bishops slice the board rooks control the open files knight can hop in queen is well placed attacking e5 facing the king this is an absolutely perfect position for white. A dream position. Queen takes f5. Knight c4, attacking the bishop. Bishop g5, you attack the knight and threaten maybe knight to d5. Rook takes d1 check. Black has to relieve the pressure. He's got less space, so it makes sense to trade pieces. Apply this strategy in your own games. If you've got less space, try and find a way to trade off some active pieces. Rook takes rook check. Knight takes d1. A very nice move. You don't play the expected rook d1 getting the file. You play an even better move, knight takes d1, because you use the pin on the c file. b3 is next, planning to win the knight. Rook d8 played. You can't win the knight yet because knight d6 exists and you attack the queen. So white now plays a better move. Bishop takes f6, deliberately exchanging bishop for knight. In an open position like this, you would never, ever, ever give up two bishops. The bishop pair, unless you have a brilliant reason. But Yan has calculated further. Bishop takes f6, take, and bishop e4. Bishop queen line up against the pawn. And this is a key difference. Queen a5 was played in the game, but if you play a move like h6, by the way, you can't play g6 because you hang your bishop. If you play h6, now b3 works out. Knight d6, well, you may think the knight attacks the queen. Rook attacks queen, so you can't do this because of this. And then black also has this as well. But it, it just doesn't work out at all because it's white's move. You just move your queen away, throw in a check, and then you take the queen. Check. Game over. King moves, and you lose your queen. Bishop e4 played. Queen a5. Get the queen out the way. You cannot take this because rook d1 check. 
Well, you can, but it's good to keep the pressure. He doesn't trade pieces because he's got a lot of pressure. This might still be winning for white, but knight c3 was chosen. Get the knight in the game, perhaps coming to d5. White continues to have this threat. King f8 played. He didn't even play h6. Uh, it actually leads to the same move, so I'm not going to go through that. King f8 played. Knight d5. This is the absolutely brilliant move for white. Rook takes d5. But you take. And after take, there's a great move here for white. It's called, it's just a double attack. You attack the king and the knight on c4 at the same time. Throw the queen in. Queen c8 check. Attack, attack. The king moves, and then you can take it. White is rook for bishop up. White is totally winning. Knight d5 played. b5 to defend the knight. Queen takes a7. White threatens checkmate in one move. Rook takes d5. Get rid of that knight. Sacrificing? No. Well, temporarily sacrificing because now there is a double attack. Black now attacks bishop and rook at the same time with queen d2. You move the rook out of the way, the bishop drops. So only move, you've got to play rook takes knight. You can't do this because check. And then you lose your bishop. You don't move it away because queen takes d5 and then you've got knight and bishop for the rook. So no, the only move here is rook takes knight. By the way, a really cool line, queen d1 check. Is black going to win material after this? Because after queen d1 check, white can only move king g2. Queen takes d5 check. You attack the rook and the king and there's only one move here. You have to block with the rook. You can't go pawn because you lose your rook. So if you play rook e4, g6, black disconnects the queen's protection onto the rook, but f3, done. Defend the rook, y is winning. Back to the game, queen d2, rook takes e4, take and e4, just cementing the bishop right in the middle. Queen takes b2, check, king e7 and queen c8. This is a really cool move. When you put the queen on c8, you put the queen behind the pawn so then this pawn is just going nowhere but more importantly you are setting up a lot of attacks with this move you attack all three pawns let's draw in all the arrows you attack this one you stop this one ever moving because it's just so slow one two three squares you also set up the threat of queen here to take on f7 you plan to set up checkmating threats queen c8 a great move you hit all three pawns queen has to come back to b6 there's no time to push the pawn, because check. Check, and then here, let's say. And then that will be mate. You can't do this, because mate. There is no time for black to push the pawn. That's why in this position, after queen c8, black chose to bring the queen back to the defense. Queen b6 to stop the queen coming here to give a check. That's why, queen here. Queen takes c4. Queen b5 played, offering a queen trade, but no way do you take it. Do not cash in too early. I don't think this is that good, because after take, take, you still have to win this. Opposite bishop endgames are known for being drawish, even though white is two pawns up. Also, in my opinion, when you get a position like this, I think it's a bit boring to offer a queen trade. Your king is safer. Your opponent's king is not. So keep the queens on, create threats, and your opponent is more likely to go wrong because his king is not a safe. So based on probability, I wouldn't even trade queens here. But also, it's just a bit boring. Go for the attack, queen c7, check. The queen has to block. If you move the king, you're gonna drop that pawn. So queen d7, queen c5, check, and in this position, black resigned. The green arrows is one option. The red arrows is the worst option. If you go king here, then bishop c6, you win the queen. If king here, then queen check. With this check, you also take the pawn on a6. King moves somewhere, and then check. And then, you're up two pawns, but this is a runner. Before we end the video, here is a brilliant moment. A brilliant tactical moment in the game Nepom Niachi versus top Chinese player Li Chao. In this position, there's an absolutely brilliant move to force checkmate in two moves. Now, black can put up more resistance, but can you find the first brilliant move? And the clue is, I want you to make queen g7 mate work. Let me know in the comments below. Here are the standings after round 10. We have 
Nepomniachi at the top, Caruana, Vachier, Lagrave, and Ishgiri, all on five and a half out of ten. Wang Hao, Grishuk, Ding Li Run, and Alexenko. Here is YouTube's suggestion for what to watch next. But if you don't like it, here's mine. Magnus Carlsen wins in 39 seconds against a Belarus Grandmaster. Sergei Shikalko 